Good morning YouTube! Today you are going to earn your stripes as car restorers. You are going to achieve the gold standard of car restoration, literally. Because today I'm going to show you how to set up a home zinc plating unit. So that you can take your rusty, corroded old pieces like this and turn them into fantastic, golden, C3PO shiny, yellow zinc passivated, restored components like these. Now, 20 years ago, this part on the right looked like this part on the left. And three days ago, this part on the left looked like this part on the right. And in two hours, this part on the right will look like this part on the left. Now, originally, just about all of the nuts, bolts, brackets, clips, metal pipes and headlight actuating rods on the car that weren't painted would have been covered in a sacrificial zinc coating which was yellow passivated for corrosion protection. Now, if you don't know what a zinc coating is or why one is used, you don't know what galvanic protection is and you don't know what passivation layers are, then watch the video in this series on rusting which will explain all about that. But what we're going to do is put that zinc coating back onto this piece because if you're in the States, hopefully some of your passivated parts are looking in a bit better condition than this, but zinc plate is typically applied at around about 25 microns thickness, and in a British climate, like this car gets used in, with salt on the roads in the winter, as a rough rule of thumb, you'll lose about one micron of thickness every year. So, after two, two and a half decades, that zinc coating has all gone, and now the steel underneath is beginning to go rusty. Now, the method we're using today is just for plating zinc onto steel. Don't try and plate any other metals using this method and don't try and plate onto any other substrates using this method. And I'm going to explain as we go through the different recipes you need for the different chemicals that we'll be using. Uh, so, but if you do need a good reference book to refer to or if you want to plate some different metals or you want to plate onto different substrates then get yourself a copy of that book. It's only about 60 pages long and it's a really, really useful reference for uh, everything that you need to know in here if it's anything you don't understand that I'm saying. For the chemicals, your options are to buy the chemicals yourself and mix them together and I'll give you the recipes for doing that. Or the other one is you can just buy a lot of these things ready made up as sort of pre-mixed solutions. Um, if you're in the UK there's a couple of companies, one's called uplate.co.uk, another one's called Gatoros Plating. I've used uplate, they're really good. A lot of other people who use Gatoros Plating, they speak very highly of them as well. So try those. It's probably, if you're starting out, it's probably easier just to buy the solutions already mixed up. If you're in the States, I, I'll I've got no experience of them myself, obviously. I hear people talking about Eastwood and Caswell Plating are a couple of companies to try for you guys. Health and safety warning! We are going to be using some deeply unpleasant chemicals, some strong alkalis, strong acids, concentrated acids and chromate iron solutions. So make sure you don the full chemical nuclear and biological warfare suit. Now it's a three-stage process. We're going to strip, clean and prepare the metal for plating. Then we're going to zinc plate the piece itself. And zinc is a sort of shiny grey type of metal. It oxidises quite readily in air to an unattractive whitish sort of deposit. So after we've plated it, then we're going to passivate it. And that will give it that attractive, distinctive sort of yellow colour that you see on the pieces. That also gives it some corrosion protection. It basically puts a few chromium ions into this, the surface of the piece so that uh, chrome oxide forms instead of zinc oxide. Side. Now those three stages, cleaning and preparation, plating and passivating, by far, by far the most important is cleaning and preparation. The, the, the plate is only 25 thousandths of a millimetre thick so any scratches, nicks, bumps, lumps and scrapes on the metal that you can see when it goes into the plating tank, you'll still be able to see when it comes out of the plating tank they'll just be a different colour. Also, if you don't get it scrupulously clean, this is chemically clean, then it won't plate at all. So you'll end up with plates on the clean bits and just bare metal on the, the, on the other parts. So, I know you're excited to get plating, but the most important bit is the next bit, getting it ready for plating. Now, cleaning them itself is a three-stage process. We're going to get the worst of the muck, surface rust, grease, grime and any uh, coatings, any paint coatings, that kind of thing, off abrasively. If you want to know how to do that, watch the video on rust removal, which shows the various techniques you can use. Now, after you've done that, if, you, if, you do any, if it's scratched or pitted or damaged in any way after you've got the rust off, then you're going to need to dress those scratches and sort of polish it before it goes into the second stage, which is an alkaline bath, which is done hot. And then as soon as it comes out of the alkaline, 
alkaline bath, it goes into a hydrochloric acid bath to pickle it. And when it comes out of the hydrochloric acid bath, then it goes straight into the plating tank. So this stage is the stage for getting the, the, the metal prepared to a surface that you're going to be happy to look at for the next 20 years. Now with these two parts, this one actually doesn't really need any preparation at all. That one's just going to go straight into the alkaline bath and then straight into the acid and the acid will take off the remaining zinc coating there and that'll be back to fresh bare steel. So that one's fine. This one is really not too bad because we've got it in time. It's really only a bit of surface rust on here to, to remove and I'm going to just do that with an abrasive wheel and an electric drill. But uh, I say if you need to know various techniques for rust removal go have a look at that video on rusting where we cover them all the options in some detail. So when you've got the surface rust off, the next thing we need to do is work out the surface area. There's a bit of mass involved, so I've got the helper to help me out here. So now you don't need to do this with a micrometer, but you do need to work out the areas reasonably accurately. So just approximate them to common geometrical shapes. So for instance, for this, we can approximate that to a cylinder, which is 0.8 centimeters in diameter and 17 centimeters long. So Edie, what's the surface area of a cylinder? Pi times diameter times the length, you dunce! <laughs> <laughs> Pi. <laughs> Pi. Times. 0.8. Times 17 centimetres long. Equals. 43, believe it or not, that's 43 square centimetres, and carry on like that for all your other parts as well. So for instance, with something like that, you can approximate this to being a right angle triangle. So that's half base times height. For this side, for instance, that's just a rectangle, isn't it? So that's just the base times the height there. Um, also with parts like that, don't forget, of course, that for the surface area, you need the surface area of not just the outside, but also the inside as well. So work out the surface area of the outside and then double it. But you know, you, 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 you'll get the hang of it. If you can't remember your areas of common shapes, then uh, that's what Google's for. Now, work them out in whatever units you want. So we were just doing it in square centimetres there. In the end, you'll need the answer in square inches, though. So how many square centimetres in, in a square inch? 2.54 squared, which is 6.45 square centimetres in a square inch. So work out all your areas, whatever unit you fancy. Convert them into square inches. Now you're wishing you paid attention in maths, aren't you? <laughs> and when you've worked out the area of your parts, then we're going to attach some copper wire to them, which we're going to use to handle pieces from now on so that we don't have to get our filthy hands on them anymore. And we're going to use this, these wires to hang the parts in the cleaning baths and in the plating bath. And when you've got your wires attached, then hold a piece by your wires and give it a good degreasing with methylated spirit or similar. Now, the alkaline cleaner is horrible stuff, so goggles, gloves and overalls on and plenty of ventilation. Here we have a stainless steel pan containing a litre of water and to that we've added 40 grams of sodium hydroxide, that is caustic soda, 25 grams of sodium carbonate, that's washing soda, and another 25 grams of sodium silicate, that's uh, colloquially known as water glass. And um, we're going to run this bath at a temperature of 90 degrees C, so that is basically just coming up to the boil, just before it starts simmering. And when we've got it up to temperature, Take our parts on our wires and just submerge them in the bath. Just agitate them a little bit in the bath. Just leave the wires sticking out so you can retrieve them at the end. And then just leave them there. And we're going to soak that at 90 degrees C for 10 minutes. Now while they're cleaning in the alkaline bath, let's go and prepare the next stage, which is the acid bath. Now, when the parts have had their alkaline bath, we're going to take them straight out of the hot alkali and plunge them while they're still hot into a bath of 10 to 20% hydrochloric acid in water. 
Um, now, hydrochloric acid is also known as muriatic acid if you're buying it. It's usually supplied like this in a concentration of 36% hydrochloric acid in water. So if you buy it like this, 36% hydrochloric acid, basically dilute this down one to one with water and that'll give you an 18% solution of hydrochloric acid which will be about ideal for what we want to do for this steel pickle last stage of our cleaning. Now this is absolutely foul stuff. Uh, with the lid off this, I mean the fumes are absolutely overpowering. So a mask on, glove, gloves, goggles, be really careful with this, it is absolutely horrible. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is if you didn't pay attention to your chemistry lessons the first time around, pay attention now and remember the old adage which is if you do it like what you ought to add the acid to the water all right it's very important you put the water in the bowl first and then add the acid to it don't do it the other way around or it's likely to explode all over you and you really don't want that okay so be careful with this but if you do kill yourself can you leave me your lotus in your will right so that, that's our acid prepared in the bowl uh, parts about 10 minutes of the alkali bath we're just going to take them straight out of the hot alkali and plunge them into the acid now that will get up any remaining scale and any remaining zinc coating on them and you can see it's going to fizz and foam quite dramatically set a timer for between one and four minutes one minute if they're just quite fresh and they just need a little bit of cleaning up four minutes at the most if they're quite rusty still Now these parts are quite clean, so I'm just going to give them one minute in the bath there and that should just etch them enough that I'll take the zinc plate. Right, and when they come out of the acid bath, that's what they'll look like, absolutely pristine steel surface. Now the surface is very much called active, it will rust within minutes if you leave it in the air. So just give them a quick rinse off in some clean water. And then we're going to put them straight into the electrolyte and start plating them. Cleaning's important, but it's not very interesting. Now the exciting part, we're actually going to do the plating. So here's what you need to set up for your plating tank. The first thing you need is a DC power supply uh, between about two and 12 volts. The ideal voltage is probably around about six volts, but actually the voltage isn't particularly important. So you can use a car battery or a car battery charger, or you can buy a, a power a supplier that's fed off the mains as long as it's got a DC output and um, around about 5 amp output will be enough for most of your plating requirements for parts the sort of size we're doing today. That's going to be fed through a variable resistor. So if you get yourself a 100 watt, 100 ohm variable resistor, that they are about £10 off eBay. Um, so not a lot of expense there. And what you're going to do there is by varying that resistance, you're going to be controlling the current that goes through the tank. Now, to monitor the current, you'll want an ammeter connected in series in the circuit. Okay, and it's a good idea, but it's not essential to also have a voltmeter connected between the positive and negative sides of the tank, so you can measure what the voltage drop across the tank actually is. But that's not essential, but you will need an ammeter so you know what current's flowing through it. Now the tank itself is basically just any pot, plastic or glass pot, something that's not going to be attacked by the acidic electrolyte that sits in there. The electrolyte we're going to be using is based on zinc chloride, so it's a slightly acidic solution of zinc chloride, about 60 grams per litre, then there's potassium chloride, about 150 grams per litre, and boric acid, 23 grams per litre. It's a very good idea to add brighteners, the proprietary brighteners. Um, one is called uh, Xylite, um, and there's, there's various ones available from the um, plating chemicals suppliers, but add those according to the manufacturer's instructions, and that'll give you a much brighter finish. Now, what we're doing is, when we connect the power supply, we've got the circuit connected like this. We have current flowing around the circuit and at the anode, the anode is just a piece of zinc dangled into the electrolyte. So um, just dangle that so it's going from the top of the water to near the bottom of the tank. And as the electricity flows through the anode, the anode is the positive side of the circuit, what we're creating at the anode is zinc ions, zinc 2 plus ions, and we're releasing electrons. The electrons flow around the circuit to the cathode. At the cathode, they recombine with those zinc ions, and that's what deposits the zinc 
metal onto the piece that's hanging from the cathode, the negative side of the circuit. So your, your, so what you're going to have for an anode is going to be a piece of zinc hanging in the electrolyte and then uh, hanging from the negative side of the circuit. So this will just be a bar across the top of the tank and you're going to dangle a copper wire with your piece connected to it into the electrolyte. It'll become a bit clearer when you see the tank in, in the next part of the video. The other thing that's important is, or it's a really good idea, it's not essential, but it's a really good idea, is to have some form of air age. If you can get someone to just blow some bubbles gently through the tank all the time it's plating, then that will help you to get a much more even coating of zinc, a much nicer looking finish. The ideal thing to use there is actually a fish tank aerator, just to sort of gently bubble air through it all the time. Other than that though, um, it's, that's pretty well all there is to it. Now the plating bath probably looks quite complicated but it's really not that bad. So just taking everything in turn. Over here at the back for a power source I'm using a battery charger. So this is a switchable 6 volt, 12 volt battery charger. And the positive lead from that is connected to this little Heath Robinson device here. Now all this is, is a little enclosure made to house a 100 watt 100 ohm variable resistor. So basically by twiddling that knob there, I can change the resistance which, if, which alters the current going into the bath. Now, that's, you, I just did it like that because I've was i got those parts available, that was the cheapest, easiest way for me to do it. To be honest, you'd probably be better just getting a power supply, just get a variable DC power supply um, of uh, up to 12 volts, up to five amp output. And then you can do away with those parts. But the output from the rear start goes through this lead, the um, jump lead, to the anode. So that and that are the anodes. They are pieces of zinc which are mounted to just a copper bracket, okay? And then they're wired together with this red wire. Okay, so that's the positive side of the tank, that's the anodes. Make sure that the copper and the copper wire stay out of the electrolyte. You only want the zinc of the anode sitting in the electrolyte. Okay, and you notice we've positioned anodes on each side of the tank. That will give you a much more even plate. If you, you can even use four if you can be bothered to have two on this side as well. So that's the positive side of the tank. In there is the electrolyte. And then this copper bar, this is just a piece of flattened copper plumbing pipe. Okay, and that is the cathode. So that's the negative side of the tank. That's then connected by this red lead to this ammeter. So we're going to monitor the current on that ammeter and then this other multimeter here is connected to the output from the rear stack there. So that I'm going to use to monitor the voltage. So that's measuring the voltage drop across the tank. Okay. And then the black lead here is the circuit back to the battery charger. Now the other thing we've got on here is an agitator. So this is a horn compressor. It's off a Lotus Elan Plus 2. Now that's a nice touch, isn't it, that I'm using a Lotus horn compressor to plate some Lotus parts. And that's connected by some petrol hose with some holes drilled in it to the electrolyte. So when we turn on the power and connect the agitator circuit, so this is just a pair of crocodile clips, then the horn compressor runs and flows air into the electrolyte. I'll just disconnect that because it's a bit noisy. Now, that's the way I choose to agitate the tank, just by blowing air in it with a horn compressor. The way most people do it is to just buy a fish tank aerator. That's probably the, 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 the better way of doing it, to be honest. But I had the horn compressor and the petrol hose, so I did it that way. So, to work out what current you need to plate at, we're going to plate three pieces which are 43 square centimetre surface area, another one the same and another one that is 116 square centimetres. So adding that up that is... Two hundred and two square centimetres. Now we need the result in square inches so we'll divide that by six... We'll divide that by 6.45 square centimetres per square inch and even I need a calculator for that. So 6.45 equals 31.3 square inches. Now you want to plate at between 0 0.1 
and 0 0.2 amps per square inch and I would recommend plating at the lower end of the range so work on plating at 0 0.1 amps per square inch so we've got 31.3 square inches of metal to plate and we're going to do it at 0 0.1 amps per square inch so that means that we need a plating current of 3.13 amps okay so we're going to set the we're going to adjust the resistance on that variable resistor to get the current as close to 3.1 amps as we can now the other thing is how long is it going to take now if you want to work this out you'll need to know that the density of zinc is I believe 7.14 grams per cc if you don't fancy working it out and just take my word for it if you plate at 0 0.1 amps per square inch then you'll deposit 25 microns so that's 25 thousandths of a millimetre every 70 minutes or so okay and that would be a normal sort of plating thickness. So that's if you plate at 0 0.1 amps per square inch. If you plate at 0 0.2 amps per square inch, you'll halve that time. So you'll deposit 25 microns in about 35 minutes. All right. If you want a thicker deposit than that for whatever reason, so if, you wanted, if you're plating at 0 0.1 amps per square inch and you wanted 50 microns of thickness, you just need to double that time to 140 minutes. Got it? All right. And once you rinse the acid off, then put them into the electrolyte and hang them from the cathode by your wires. That's what's going to make the electrical contact to make the circuit um, all the way around. Try and hang them more or less in the middle of the electrolyte. Don't hang them in all the sediment at the bottom of the tank and certainly don't obviously have them sticking out the electrolyte at the top. And then the only other thing is make sure they're not touching the anode. You don't want them shorting out on the anode itself. Um, other than that though, let's just turn the power on and... Then we're just going to adjust. So, so here on the ammeter there, you see with the power turned on, at the moment we've got 0.223 amps. So we're just going to wind the rheostat up until we get our target of 3.1 amps. So 3.6 amps is the closest I can get to that target of 3.1 amps. So I'm going to have to knock the time down accordingly. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is that things that are closer to the anodes are going to plate more than things that are further away from the anodes. Things that are facing the anodes are going to plate more than things that are hidden from the anodes. So try to move the pieces around periodically if you can, if you, and that will give you a more even plating all over. The only other thing though is to connect, connect our agitator, our aerator, and leave it there for, well we've got the time down now to about just under an hour. And when your plating's finished, that's what your parts will look like. That's what they come out like a sort of semi-bright silvery grey colour. Um, and if this is for sort of show car work, you can polish that to really quite a nice lustre before we passivate it. But these are just functional parts, so we're just going to go straight ahead and passivate them. Now with the passivation, what we're doing is we're going to dip them into a solution which is rich in chromate ions. And so that chrome will um, diffuse into the surface there. And that will mean that rather than zinc oxide forming on the surface this when we're using it, it will be chromium oxide that forms on the surface, which has just got a more attractive patina basically. Now you can get a variety of different coloured passivates, but this is a yellow passivate that we are using. Um, if you want to make it yourself, then it is either sodium or potassium dichromate in water. Um, so you want about between 60 and 120 grams of the dichromate in a litre of water, um, depending on how intense you want the yellow colour to be. And to that you're going to add 3 mils of concentrated sulfuric acid. So that's if you really want to make it yourself. To be honest, it's easy just to buy it made up though. They're not expensive passivates and a litre of it will last you a lifetime. So all we then do is get our part and this doesn't take long. All we're going to do is dip the part in there and agitate it for between about 10 and 20 seconds. Again, depending on how strong you want that yellow colour to be. pretty good and then just rinse it off don't touch it but just rinse it off in water and then now hang that up to dry for 24 hours so don't touch it for 24 hours I know you want to stroke it and love it but just leave it alone until it's a chance to go hard because the passivate it will just wipe straight off if you touch it 
uh, while it's still wet. So before we start admiring our parts and congratulating ourselves and you rush out and start buying the things you need to do this for yourself, let's just have a few words about things that might go wrong and also what we're going to do with these chemicals at the end of their life. So when your parts come out of the plating tank they should look like that so you'll have a nice even semi-bright coating of silvery grey zinc all over the part. But if you have rough granular looking deposits like this that's caused by your current density being too high. The surface feels like a Brillo pad. Now if the whole part's affected by that, it's just your current's too high. So go back and check your area calculations and the current that you're using and redo it. If you've just got a local bit like that, you can either just live with it as we're doing here because these are just sort of functional parts, or if the real the finish is really important, you can sand it back lightly before passivating will improve it no end. Um, in this case, all that's caused by is just that part's just a little bit too close to the anode. So sort of try and space as difficult, but just, as much as you can, just space out the the parts e evenly between the anodes, try and make sure everything's at equal distance from the anodes and also get your tank agitation going should help you with those sort of problems. Other than that, though, most of your problems are going to be down to surface preparation. If, the, if it won't plate or the plating won't stick to some areas, that's just cleanliness. So most of your problems are going to be down to poor cleaning. The other problem you might get though is if you start getting really ugly looking deposits like this, really dark grey, quite soft when it's just come out of the tank, you can always rub it off with your finger. That's just you, eventually you're going to reach the point where you're electrolyte is getting worn out. It's called bleed out and it's some components of the electrolytes getting consumed. Now you can try and save the electrolyte if you want. Normally if you add a bit more potassium chloride to it that will help to, uh, to cure this. It might be that you need some more brighteners and also check the pH. The pH should be around about pH 5 and if it's not you can add more acid to bring it down to, to that level but to be honest on the scale we're working at there you're probably best off just discarding the solution and starting again with some fresh what it's going to cost you. Now that brings us to the subject of disposal of these chemicals and also how to protect ourselves from them while we're using them because you probably notice we're going through some of these things are seriously nasty. You can do some serious damage with the hydrochloric acid but the, the one that's probably the most dangerous is the passivate, the chromium, chromate ions in the passivate are carcinogenic and really really quite unpleasant so we don't really want to be sticking this stuff you won't, not, not we don't really you shouldn't be sticking this stuff down the drain when you finish with it without treating it um, so with the electrolyte if you're discarding the electrolyte the way to do that is to hang a piece of scrap in the electrolyte when you're finished with it and plate it out for a few hours at the lowest current then the lowest current that you can maintain that will sort of maintain a steady current and that should get all the so things like the copper the lead um, cadmium, anything, any nasty heavy metals like that should plate out onto the piece of scrap and then just dis discard the piece of scrap as a, as a solid at your recycling centre. What will still be in the solution is any chromium that's come off the metal, so we want to get rid of that before we put it down the drain. The way to treat that is with sodium metabisulfate, add that to the electrolyte before discarding of it, and that will reduce the chrome 6 plus down to chrome 3 plus, which is a lot less harmful. Um, sodium metabisulfate is quite common because it's used as a preservative in wine making so you should be able to get it from a, a, a um, home brew sort of wine making suppliers. The same goes for the passivate, when the passivate comes to be discarded, the passivate will, will, will last you almost indefinitely, at least a litre of passivate will be surprised if you ever get through it in your lifetime, you use hardly any of it. But if you do need to discard of it, then don't just stick that down the drain because it is really quite nasty stuff, it is carcinogenic uh, both to you and to everything else that it touches. So that really does need to be treated with sodium metabisulfate before it goes down the drain. So protect the environment and make sure you protect yourself as well with the uh, gauntlets, the overalls and the goggles because it's pretty obvious when you get the acid on yourself, not so much when you get that carcinogenic chromate on yourself though, so take care. Uh, if it does go wrong though, just stick it back in the acid bath to strip the zinc plate off and just replate it. Let's face it, once you've stuck it back in the electrolyte you can go away and do something else. Now it happens that fortunately the time it takes to plate a piece like that is almost exactly the same time as the running time of Get Weird by Little Mix. So by the time you've made a cup of tea and listened to your Get Weird by Little Mix CD, your part will be... Don't always believe in your soul. You got the power to know